And uh, Roy, you brought up uh, uh, the whole issue of uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, Karen, uh, care to comment on that? that? That, of course, doesn't necessarily apply to a patient with a specific uh, molecular abnormality. What's your take on the recent data? It's been fairly exciting. So, I mean, I think harnessing the immune system to, um, to bring a new way to treat lung cancer is um, novel and exciting. Um, so, as Roy brought up, the PD-1 inhibitors, which stands for program cell death protein 1 PD-1 and the ligand PD-L1, um, there are uh, monoclonal antibodies and um, they block the interaction that negative, negatively um, inhibits the immune system to then activate the immune system. And there have been some promising results that um, I think Roy is going to talk about. Roy, yeah. what's your uh, take on some of the uh, initial trials? And then uh, Everett, uh, uh, perhaps we can go back to some of the prior trials looking at ipilimumab. No, I, I think it, it, it really is a, a paradigm changing um, uh, set of agents now for, for our patients with non small cell lung cancer. You know, we've talked a bit about driver mutations, and now with the TCGA data nearly fully, you know, published, we see that there are only going to be a handful of true driver mutations at high frequency in lung cancer. But if you look at lung cancer, um, it has uh, among the most mutations of any tumor type. It's right up there with melanoma um, and, uh, of course, because of some of the toxins uh, uh, that, that it's exposed to. So you would think it would be a very immuno immunogenic tumor. And as Karen says, this whole PD-1, PD-L1 mechanism, which actually turns off the T cells and, and b basically camouflages the tumor from the T cell recognition, is, is something that, that we, we really are now beginning to take advantage of. And there are a number of agents that have been studied. Um, we've had a good deal of experience with this at Yale. My colleague Scott Gettinger and Mario Snow, um, a number of years back, studied a drug um, from uh, Bristol-Myers, now known as nivolumab, um, which is an antibody against PD-1. And the response rates, you know, are, are quite high uh, in the 20 percent range, you know, in, in, in lung Certainly cancer. Certainly in uh, competition with what we typically see with uh, conventional cytotoxin. Well, the thing is, not only that, it, it's that uh, you're, we're seeing responses in these difficult to treat pe patient groups that we're discussing, the RAS mutated patients, the, the, the patients who have had an EG, EGFR or, or ALK uh, 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 abnormalities and now are refractory. You know, th this might be a good way to treat those patients when that happens or maybe use it up front. But what you're seeing is you're seeing these patients not only respond, but you're seeing very durable responses, you know, and th that can last a long period of time. And there were even data at ASCO uh, this year showing that even after the patient stops the drug, the response continues. Uh, suggesting that there might even be a reprogramming of the whole immune uh, system. So I think these agents are quite interesting. There are also agents now in lung cancer that target PDL1, the other side of the coin. Um, uh, those data also suggest that response rates are in the 20 percent range. Do you think there's a uh, useful marker yet, or um, do you think that'll remain e elusive? Well, searching for a marker here is even more difficult than with some of the other agents we've talked about because we know that PDL1 is induced by interferon gamma, so it's an inducible marker. So at the very get-go, when you take the biopsy is going to make a difference. Where you biopsy the tumor is going to make a difference. Fresh biopsy versus several years ago. And then, of course, you know, we know that it's not only uh, the PDL1 on the tumor cell, but it can also be on some of the uh, cells in the tumor microenvironment. So, you know, this is, this is an area that's evolving. Um, most of the biomarker data that have been presented, for example, with the MPDL, the PDL1 agent, which I'm familiar with, I, I presented some of that at ASCO, would suggest that you can enhance uh, the, 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 the positive uh, response rate if, if you use a marker. If you look for 5 percent, 10 percent staining with a marker, you can probably get your response rate from 20 percent, maybe up to 40 percent. But still, even using a marker like that, you still might see 13, 14, 15 percent response rate in marker ne negative patients. So it, it's part of, but not the whole story. But I think that the marker will play a role here. I'm very interested in actually learning you know, there may be our other markers. Maybe it's the type of mutation has a difference. Maybe it's something about the host uh, genome and something about the MHC and about the, the patient's uh, T cells. And this is going to become more important, Corey, I think, as we think about combinations. Because we tend to be somewhat empirical in how we combine agents, and we should be. We, we, we want to, we, we take two agents that work, but I think especially as we target the immune system and the tumor cell, we're going to have to use the best science we have to really think about how to do this in the best possible way. Well, speaking of combinations,